reflects the time in which it was I mean, certainly today, you know, a pair of Converse trainers and, you know, the, the, the suit that's being worn by David Tennant at the moment is precisely of now. And they all were, in their way. They reflected either what people were wearing or the mood of the time, and as he did, did mine. But what a mood it must have been in the 80s. I mean, <clears throat> I must say, I didn't wear stuff like that myself. And it did strike me, two things strike me about the, the, the doctor in his costume. One is, any other person, time, anybody, doesn't wear the same thing every day of their lives. Whereas the doctor seems to. I mean, either he's got lots of them, or the, the TARDIS has got some miraculous cleaning powers, or Time Lords don't perspire, or attract dirt, I don't know. But first of all, he's wearing exactly the same thing. And secondly, I can't remember what the second it was. Why is he wearing exactly the same thing? And secondly, secondly, I can't remember. Secondly. I'm going gaga. <laughs> Were you... Uh, so, oh yes, secondly. I remember secondly. You would think that after 900 years of going around and doing things that might attract attention of the unwelcome kind, you'd wear something that blended into the background, wouldn't you? Something kind of dark or something like everybody else at the place you're going to. For heaven's sake, he's got a piece of paper in it now. That's a brilliant idea that shows whatever the person he's expecting to see, you know, the invitation, the identification as a policeman, all those things. Why couldn't you have a costume made of the same material that made him be wary whatever the people he was with would find? Oh, that's a idea. Yes. But the, the reason they don't do that, of course, is because wardrobe has a finite budget. And if the doctor's changing clothes every episode as well as everybody else, um, it costs money. It's the same reason the TARDIS was always shaped like a police box. Of course. It's much easier to keep it that way. So, Coming into the, the series, it interests me that you, you're coming into an established setup. You, 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 uh, your co stars, at least in, in the form of Nicola, as the, the companion, is already sort of established. She's been a little while. The production team continue, uh, continued from before. D does that present particular challenges for you coming into that, or does it, does it make it easier? I suppose it does both, really. Um, it does make it easier because everybody else except you knows what they're doing. Um, um, but I was very lucky that the, the first producer was Peter Moffat, who, who was a lovely man, sadly man, no longer with us. Um, who said to me, look, you know, um, unless you ask me for, for help, it's up to you what you do, because you are the doctor. You've been cast because uh, John Nathan Turner and the head of series thought you were the right person for it. So just go and do your thing. And unless, you know, there's something strange going on that you don't understand or doesn't help, I'll, I'll leave you to it, which he did. And I found that very liberating. I have to say, of all the work I've ever done in television or theatre, I was more relaxed when I started doing Doctor Who than anything else I've ever done. Now you think, oh, blimey, you must be a big head, but it's not that. It's because uh, I knew it was entirely down to me. Whereas every other job you do, you know, the, the, everyone has a very clear idea of the character you're playing. Um, we all know who the Doctor is in one sense, but how I chose to interpret it was my choice. You weren't given any guidance at all? You weren't, you weren't told, be nasty, be nice? You were told, no, I, mean, I was told that they were going to make the, the script dictated yeah, that, sure. of course. Um, you know, and we, we agreed that you know, it, it was going to be a tricky regeneration, and that for a few episodes we weren't going to know what this Doctor was really like. And I found that brave and challenging. You know, I, I, I love watching things on television where you're not being spoon-fed, where, you know, you're not quite sure. Uh, the example I always give, and forgive me if you've heard it before, is in Pride and Prejudice, um, the character of Darcy. For nine-tenths of the book, you think he's a villain. And for the last tenth of the book, you realise that he's the true hero. He's the one who's had the best motives of everybody else at heart, and uh, he's been badly um, treated by everybody else. And I kind of like that. I'd like that as a plan for the doctor. You know, why is he behaving like that? Don't like him. And then gradually warm to them. I find in life, life's like that, the people you start off liking the least very often end up your best friends. And the ones on first glance you think are quite pleasant you end up hating the ground they walk on for whatever reason. Um, 
I found you very close when I met you. <laughs> and you still are. But there are exceptions in all cases. You know what I mean?